How did you first get involved in the world of Dungeons and Dragons or other tabletop games? How far back does that go for you? Josh, the game started in 1970. What is it? It's not 1970. I think it's like 1976, 75. Uh-huh. Right. When did Dungeons and Dragons start? Sometime. Oh, yeah, I have to actually double check that, but it's right around that. Yeah. Shoot me a text because now I'm curious. Um, that's when I started playing. So I was a kid running around the streets of Tustin, California. <laughs> yeah. Pack of wild children. Like we would play, we we tackle each other and play football on the streets. We'd ride bikes way too far to buy way too much candy. And at some point, David Larson said we should play this game Dungeons and Dragons. And that was it. We started playing. Um, I stopped playing when I was in junior high school because only losers played Dungeons and Dragons back then. And then started playing again when I was 21. The guys I played with when I was 21, I still play with now. It's 50, uh, you know, I'm 53 years old, so it's been 30, 32 years. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, and the, the best way to spend my life. I mean, that's if I have Father's Day, if I have my birthday, I game every two Tuesdays. Uh, it's my favorite thing in the world. What do you think the appeal of role playing is in games? Uh, I think the appeal is, is simple. I think that uh, people, sorry, I'm going to open this. Um, I think that people, uh, dude, I think people like telling stories. I think telling stories is as old as time itself. Mm. I think the idea of sitting around with people that you're at a table with and, and sharing a story that goes on across years, that spans years, um, is what brings people together. I always say it's the best way to spend a life. I think that, um, yeah, it, it, it's fun. It's funny. There's energy. It's the transaction. It's time you take out for yourself. It's times where you get to turn the wool off. No phones are welcome. You're not worrying about email. You're not worrying about the things for your wife, your kids. Uh, you can just be engaged with the people around you. That's, that's the best part. So why does whiskey or even other alcohols potentially uh, complement the community building of a tabletop game? Yeah, I listen, I certainly would never advocate saying that any booze or any drugs <laughs> yeah. are needed in any way, shape, or form to enjoy this game in any way, shape, or form. But I will say this, the, um, there is something really lovely, I think, about a game, or a story, like a Dungeons and Dragons story or RPG, we are not affiliated with Dungeons and Dragons. I, I had to say that because I keep talking about Dungeons and Dragons because that's what I yeah. play, but we're not affiliated with them. Um, but there's something incredibly powerful about a game that goes on for years at a time, right? Told amongst friends that correlates to, it takes anywhere between seven to 10 years, 15 years to make an incredible whiskey. There's a time that goes into building that whiskey. There's a time that goes into telling the story. And, and both of them are about sitting around with friends talking. I mean, the idea about whiskey that I think is really interesting is that it's, it's, it's not like a vodka or a tequila that's shot or in a nightclub. Whiskey generally is about, you know, sitting around, sipping it with friends and, and, and bullshitting. And, and so, um, and, and fellowship with friends around a table. So I think that, that the correlation between those two things is undeniable. Do you feel like there's also like an ancient sense to whiskey in a way that kind of heightens that atmosphere as well? Yeah, I, I like that idea. Yeah, I think there's a craftsmanship that's uh, been made, yeah. right? And there's like an old world vibe. There's an old, like the thing about whiskey is that if you talk to a master blender right and you'll say why did you pick this wood why did you pick this peat or this you know this mash blend they'll have a story behind it it's not like you know it, it's not like you just pour it into a bathtub and whip it up it's curated over time right the whiskey barrel on the top of of the um of the rack is different and tastes different than the whiskey barrel that's on the bottom of the rack because of the amount of oxygen, because of the amount of sunlight, there's like a magic that goes into curating whiskey that um, I think the same thing goes into a great game of D&D. Where did the idea for Quest and Whiskey begin? And were you around for the whole time? Yeah, I'm one of the co-founders, uh, owners. So it, it's definitely, um, it, it was a pretty interesting 
incubation. We what happened was that I have a buddy of mine who's a screenwriter. Together, we've worked together before in the past, and we've been looking for something to do. We've been trying to build a TV show. We've been trying to build movies together. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're always trying to find avenues to work. Um, and he saw what I was doing with Beetle and Grimm's, which is a high-end Dungeons & Dragons company I own with my four best friends. And he saw what our other, what we call him the spirit guru of, of quests and, and find familiar spirits was doing with his company, Blue Run, so he owns a company, Blue Run, that just sold the Molson Coors. And basically what Blue Run was doing is creating a high-end whiskey experience and going direct to customers. And what he, we were doing, Beetle and Grimm's, doing high-end gaming accessories and going right to customers. He's like, well, why don't we, is there a world just as credit? He's like, what if we did, what if we did that together? What if we put those two things together? And so that was sort of the beginning. That was the kernel of the idea. What we ended up doing was taking this idea and then expanding it, right? So Find Familiar Spirits, which owns Quest Seven, is a company that's based on the idea of building high-end premium spirit experiences for specific fandoms. So this is the first fantasy sort of themed whiskey. Uh, and now we have all these different iterations coming to market in the not too distant future. I mean, I'm fascinated by the narrative of even the titles, starting off with Paladin, going into Rogue, Warlock, Dragon, can you speak to me a little bit about this concept and what like what those titles might mean? Yeah, yeah. So each bottle of Quest Seven, there are 16 in total, has a different character. Um, each bottle also delivers with it a, a booklet, a 16-page booklet, like a like a graphic novel. Cool. Um, and there's an ongoing story from episode one from Paladin. Uh Paladin to uh, the last bottle, which we don't know the name of it yet, but it's a story. So each bottle has a chapter of the story. Our character, our hero character is Saren of the Pit. So she starts the open, she opens that story up as a gladiator and the gladiator pits fighting a combatant that if she vanquishes, she gets her freedom. And that's where we start the story in each drop from Rogue to Warlock, to Dragon, each one of them will progress the story over time. So it's a it's an adventure in a bottle. Um, and it's two things that are interesting. So, you know, what's important to us is that we have this great storytelling aspect, right? So Tyler Jacobson, who's a modern master of fantasy art, is doing all of the art, right? So he, he curated the characters, he all the... All the art in the book is done by him. Mm -hmm. um, he designed the bottle. We collectively designed the bottle. Kate Walsh is penning the story. Yeah. So that's one aspect that will carry through. The other aspect is that Tim Sparapani, who's our spirit guru, and 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 Justin and I are all very focused on delivering incredible whiskey experiences uh -huh. that coincide with incredible gaming experience. All right. I am someone, I I like whiskey, but I'm not experienced. So for the normals like me, like, how is this going to taste? Is it, can we handle the fire of it if we're inexperienced? So it is a hundred proof. So it's definitely got a lot of bang for the buck. Okay. Uh, we, first of all, you can always add water and ice, which is how I drink my whiskey. I can never drink a neat whiskey. I am not that masculine. Okay. I do not have nearly enough hair on my chest. Um, so I I always suggest uh, find your whiskey how you like your whiskey, which is neat, on the rocks, or with soda. I don't care how you drink it. Um, but each bottle I think one of the cool things about the brand is that each bottle is curated specifically for the character. So Paladin, for example, is um, is based on this. Our, here, I'll read you our tasting notes, which I think are really cool, which at this point I should memorize. But um, the game was 1974. Um, uh, okay, this is our tasting notes for Paladin. Notes of, of vanilla and fruit in keeping with the noble aims of a paladin with the undercurrent of spice to reflect her fighting spirit. So e like again, each one of the drops will have a different collection of blended whiskeys to create a different flavor profile for each bottle. Cool. 
Um, so back to like the world of fantasy, personally, my experience with it is more with the video game angle, like Zelda or Skyrim. What do you sort of experience in the world of fantasy outside of tabletop games? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, tabletop games are sort of my core competency. That's yeah. like saying like a ninja. Well, do you know how to shoot a bazooka? Um, <laughs> so I, so yeah, I mean, look, I play video games. Like I play, um, I'm looking forward to playing Baldur's 3. Hmm. Um, but I am a big gamer. I was always like a, a, a big gamer. So I think that that's sort of where I, like in Assassin's Creed, I played for nice. a long time. Yeah. out of war played for a long time so i like video games a lot um so i think that's probably and then look i i read I this thing called books i don't know if you kids know about them these days they're book books you've got pages and words and, okay yeah you should check them out they're really good they're great well um, but you know reading i think is where also like you know sort of getting into um like that's like the, my favorite thing to do is to have a vacation where you get to do nothing but read what was like the last standout book you read? Right now I'm reading Way of the Blade, which is an amazing book. But the last standout book I had is I'm very excited you asked. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Christopher Buellman wrote a book called Black Tongue Thief that is incredible. He's now writing the sequel, um, mm -hmm. which is going to be equally amazing, I'm sure. But uh, he is my favorite author. And this book is this tells the story of the Goblin Wars, and it's incredible. And I remember exactly where I was when I finished it. It was on my wife, right after my wife's 50th birthday, um, and I was in a really cool place. And so I had this vision of finishing the book and looking around me, and I just happened to be on a boat at the time, which sounds very fancy. It was, mm -hmm. and there I was closing this journey uh, with my favorite author and a collection of characters that I adored. I like that. So obviously you've made a name for yourself in the landscape of horror. How do you find horror and fantasy to cross paths? Do you think they exist sort of on the same realm? I do. I think it's a good question. Um, I do. I think that both of them take what I call a suspension of disbelief, right? So you have to buy into a horror premise to some extent. Um, and and allow yourself to be carried away to be scared, right? Because if you if you pay attention, you're actually in a theater or in your living room, and there's really nothing coming out of the TV to kill you. But yet, that suspension of disbelief allows you to buy into the to the suspense of the moment, which um, I think is the same thing for Lord of, for Lord of the Rings for fantasy. If you look at a movie like Lord of the Rings, right, and you're watching Frodo. And his journey to destroy the last ring, like the end of that movie, I was in tears. Why? Because I had bought into the the storytelling aspect. There's like this, you know, this level of um, I don't know. It, it it plays on a make believe in a way that's different than a right down the middle drama. Perfect. So my last question for you today uh, is a bit of a riddle but I'm speaking from Dread Central, a website that covers all things horror. So I'm wondering from your perspective, why should our audience, why should horror fans uh, decide to pick up a bottle of Quest Send whiskey opposed to any other whiskey? Oh, that's a good question. Um, here's, I think that fans of horror, right? It's not like the fan, it's not like fans of a game. Right, it's mm -hmm. the passing thing. Fans of horror are people that like stories that are are enraptured with stories that are moved by stories. So the thing about Quest End, if you walk down a Bevmo, right, and you see the 150 yards of whiskeys in front of you, they all look the same and sort of like you know it's old man this and <laughs> and crow doctor that whatever. I mean, there's like you know it's it's sort of the same sort of tropes. Yeah. to sell you their brown juice. Um, and I think the thing that sets us apart is that each one of Quest End's drops is a story built for a community 
that we're super passionate about. Um, and if you like stories and, and, you, and if you're in, and if you can connect to a community like the RPG gaming community, then I think you'll really appreciate what we're doing as a company. Cool. Perfect. Well, it was great meeting you and best of luck with the project. I appreciate you. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. Bye for now.